Hello everyone. We have chosen Pat McNeely, better known as Pan Man Pat, uh, interview and information as the foundation for the Toronto Caribbean history. He's been one of the earliest and he covered just about all aspects in the magazine, from the mode of travel to the social area to the entertainment to being around Fleming and Park. And uh, also, most importantly, he showed that West Indians and people from the Caribbean, when we came here, we were also productive citizens. Well, my name is um, Pat McNeely. Um, along the journey, the musical journey that has been my life, I've become known as Pan Man Pat. I've done so much work around the pan that um, they attached the pan to my name. <laughs> so around 1967, so I came a year before 1966. A significant thing to note is that Canada was going to celebrate its centennial as a country. And that's not a very long time. Now, 50 years approximately before that, there must have been a plan because they went to several parts of the world and started Canadian missionary schools. And the mission still continued today. So I was fortunate to start off in a Canadian missionary school, QREP CM school. And then I went on to Hillview. So I had Canadian teachers and a Canadian connection. I was taught Canadian geography. I didn't know why. But it seemed that at the end of our journey around 65, 66, Lester Pearson, the Prime Minister then of Canada, decided to formally open the doors to immigration to parts of the world that didn't enjoy free immigration before. So if you lived in Trinidad and you were in Canada in the late 50s or early 60s, it was by virtue of a scholarship or your parents paid for you to be here. And, um, you, and when you completed your studies, you went back home. But so, so Trinidadians, for the first time, and people from other parts of the Caribbean and other parts of the world would be able to come to Canada. And if you lived here three years and had a, a little productive type life, you, you became a Canadian citizen. So that was the trend. So I came in the earliest of earliest, maybe within a month or two of the gates being opened. Um, I had a visa to come a year before that to study. And um, so when we came to Toronto, I lived right at um, right where Caravana began, you know, in Devonshire Place. My brother had a place there with the university. And um, just behind the, uh, the museum and all that. Yeah, so um, Bedford St. George Subway, you know. The subway only ran to Eglinton going north. And going east-west, I think Woodbine and uh, Keel might have been the stops then. And um, it was 20 cents to ride the subway. It was um, 10 cents for a cup of coffee. We, um, Toronto was just opening up. So we thought it was a hot, jumping city. But a lot of those businesses were kind of new because they expected a, a crowd of people coming in. And um, so the big thing to do would be on a Sunday is to walk down to Sam the Record Man to look at records. If the West Indian community from the late 60s when I was here until maybe the early 70s, it started growing. It started growing in 66. You'll be walking down Young Street and you see a black face across the street and you cross over to say, where are you from? How long you come? You know? And you say, we just go on the weekend type of thing and you tell them where the club is and they'll come out and everybody is getting together one by one, you know, the community get it. And living in an apartment for the first time, renting a room and kitchen and stuff. Listen, you could get a room and kitchen on a second floor for $15 a week. Working for the government was 48 bucks a week. Here in Canada, <laughs> and I mind you, you had to wear a jacket, you know, a sport jacket, just to walk down Young Street eh, to fit in. <laughs> you had to wear a jacket, like a, a corduroy jacket. I had a green one with the leather patch. 
you know, and that was common and stuff. And um, in the summer, to wear a jacket and stuff, and um, it was a nice society. We weren't in the habit of going to the pub, but that's what people did, so we joined along. You put a dollar on the table and you get 10 draft bay and stuff, you know, <laughs> one dollar. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now, I um, started playing music right away at the Trinidad Club. So when Sparrow and Lord Kitchener, this guy um, who was a lawyer, Charles Roach, um, he had the Trinidad Club and you had guys like Selwyn Gomes would play and you had um, Joe Brown. Uh, who later went on to the trade winds, and Terry mm -hmm. Dale, who went on to the trade winds, and Clive Rustin, who went on to the trade winds, and now is um, in the Cayman, um, some of them. Yeah, Terry Pass. So I started playing music right away, and I, I, I linked up with a few guys. And when you got a job as a musician back then, it was nice. You, you were hired for six nights. And it might be in tongue or out of tongue, Monday to Saturday. And um, sometimes in the afternoon on Saturdays, there'll be a matinee and people come for that too. So um, I'm on the road playing music and um, my mom always, my mom had 12 kids, you know, and um, she always led us in a good direction, you know, and most, all of us um, became something in some way um, because of her influence and her involvement with our lives. So she always told me, you know, you got to have something to fall back on. So I'm out in Ontario on the road having fun. We're up in Wasega Beach for two or three weeks. And I told the band, like, I have to cut this out and go back to Toronto and get settled. I'm here a year and a half. It's now 68, you know. Um, in 67, there was Caravana, but we'll talk about that when it comes up. So I decided to leave the band. I'm here in Toronto. Um, on a Monday morning, and I didn't have a job. I left the band. I'm in my apartment for the first time. And I went and got a Toronto Star newspaper, and there was this big half-page ad. They were looking for police officers. Now, I always felt good about myself and my education, and I didn't feel lacking. So I put on a suit, the suit I traveled with, and my tie and stuff. Went down to police headquarters. And um, I filled out the application, and they hired me. But they said the class is going to be like in a six months. Um, no, the class is going to be six months time. But you're a good guy. We'd like to hang on to you. Uh, my dad was a police officer in Trinidad when he was young, eh? oh, in Tabaki. So, and I was a boy scout, <laughs> you know, system troop leader and stuff. Um, along with Mervyn Prescott, you might recognize that name. Yeah, uh, yeah, he was the troop leader then. Yeah, so, uh, so I joined the police force, but they put me out, they gave me a course for like a week or so and taught me how to write parking tickets. <laughs> so, so for the first four or five months, I, I started writing parking tickets, waiting to be called. And bang, the police college called me and I did very well. I made 93 in my overall in police, you know, and stuff. Mm. So I'm out on the beach here in 14 Division. In the middle of 14 Division, there's Honest Eds. So it's Spadina, Lansdowne, Dav DuPont, Lake. You know, next to that was 52 Division, a hot division to kind of encompass downtown and so on. So they were the, um, the, the lively part, you know, where immigrants were coming and, and, and settling in and moving out, expanding. And stuff. So when I go down there to see any driving in the car or whatever, I used to ride the motorbike. Um, I'll see guys playing on a Sunday morning, mid morning, and they would be dressing the black like like ref. We only saw the referee dressed like that home, you know. And then we had jerseys after a while, yeah. but they were dressed up and stuff. It was mostly foreign guys. I later became I uh, got to know that they were Scottish guys or English guys and stuff. But you'd see the odd black person in the crowd after a while. And that started to grow two or three and stuff until they were playing against them. You know, it's like newspapers, black and white playing and stuff, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and reds all over. <laughs> so, and that, I think, 
started off the, the soccer, but my eyes was not on the ball. I, my eyes was on a different beat, you know, and from one beat up north to this beat down on 14 division. Club Trinidad sold the license to um, two Jamaican businessmen. And, um, and it was in one, the lane just south of Bloor Street on Young, a lane. And they had these businesses there. And you could go, you could drive east from Young Street on the lane and you had to make a, a left turn and come out and blow. Right now, they put a big, 25 story or something yes. there. Yes. Marshall and they were involved there for a while. And then the two Jamaican guys, one was Roy Williams and Frank Wallace. And they moved to Basel Street, just south of Blue, south of where Contrast was. Urbana Club. And that was a big club. We had a group like the Cougars. Yeah. Because you know why I remember? When it was Carabana Club, they had gone through the one by Young Street there and come down. Um, one night, you know, I like music, you know. <laughs> so I dressed up in this blue uniform with a belt across and a hat. I forget. I just knew it's club time. So I pulled the car up and take a run inside. To, if you see me run, <laughs> I go to the back where the musicians hang out, you know. No problem. Yeah. They see that boy man scatter. <laughs> then they realize, you know, who it was. Back then, I wasn't the only trainee. You had Cutties was an officer too. Good officer after me, a couple of years after me, and then they had, um, I forget, Kel, Kel, Kelvin Sibalo, the drummer of the Trade Winds. He, he, he became a police officer too, and then he went to Trinidad and opened a security firm. Um, okay. And then I, um, I, I decided to move on. Um, a lawyer asked me to come and work for him, so that kind of stopped my plans for a while. And I thought, that'd be interesting. I said, doing what? You know, you're a lawyer. Doing what? He said, just what I do. I need assistance. So I became his private assistant and investigator. And that took me for about seven, eight years. He was capitalizing on court training. I had court appearance. Um, I had experience in evidence and developing evidence. And then he made me a commission of affidavit. So I had experience doing that as well. And I had a good college background from Trinidad. So I quickly learned how to do affidavits and stuff. You know, I could do it on the spot. So, so that experience took up a large portion of my life. And for me, it was either, you know, my mom said, you got to keep going. So I was going to go to law school or something else. And I chose something else. So the West Indian community, the only organized group there were, were before we came, the UNIA, United Negro Immigrant Association, which was formed in England by Marcus Garvey and stuff. And the Jamaicans who came here kept that going. Um, and then there was also the WIF Club, which came out of that UNIA. And they were situated near College and Spadina on the second floor. And um, the, the West Club would be the WIF, West Indian Federation Club. Started back when there was talk of a federation. So we all went there. I became a member of that and stuff. Just next to that, a couple of buildings up, there was um, the first doctor, black doctor qualified. There was nowhere for him to practice. No place will take him in. They never did it before, you know. Mm -hmm. Have a doctor go and cut people and all of that. So the, the Ontario government had to make a provision for him to start his own place. And he started around the WIF club there and later moved next door into what's called Doctor's Hospital. The name of the street is after him, Dr. Augusta. But similarly, the first lawyer, the black lawyer to get qualified, you have to go on article for a year or two with a firm and then you became independent. There was no firm that would take him. They never did it before, so they don't know if it'll work up. Um, so he was allowed to start his own practice. And today we have an association started by Charles Roach and they long after in his memory. It's called the Rogers Delos Davis Society and the Black Lawyers Association and so on. We were speaking out for our community in contrast the publisher was a Canadian-born gentleman by the name of Al Hamilton. And um, 
he was never the editor, but he was a good businessman. So Al started the contrast, as he said, in a station wagon. And those days, the paste up was, you know, a little thing by hand, and you use wax to put things on the paper on the on the mass sheet, and you make a mass head and stuff. So after leaving 14 Division, I used to see contrast there. So I pull up and tell the guy, you know, I could write a little. I could write. And um, there's a lot of activities starting up in the Caribbean community with music. And I remember we had a guy in Trinidad named Brunel Jones, who used to write about the entertainment and the evening news. And I thought, I'd like to write a column for you. And he said, well, we can't hire anybody at the moment. I said, well, I didn't say hire, you know. I said, I'd like to write a column for you. So I started off right away. I think I had two already written, which I gave him, and he had to choose which one he'd start off with. Mm -hmm. I called my column West Indian Bandstand. There were guys like Al Peabody. He did the local Canadian entertainment, the Jamaican gentleman. And we had a guy um, who was the editor, Harold, Harold Hoyt. He was Barbadian. He was here for a couple of years, and he worked for as long as he could. And then there were other editors and stuff. And then he went to um, Barbados and opened the Nation, the, the Nation newspapers, which I think is still going on. So on a contrast, we would publish once every, a week on Fridays. And we'd have like hair products, you know, and we'd advertise the barbershops and the Caribbean groceries and um, the, 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 the hair places for ladies, you know, to do the hair and Solomon Barber Shop, and Monica's, and Eglinton, and so on. on. On Fridays, when the papers came, I used to drive a Volkswagen bug. And just out of community interest, I used to take bundles of the newspapers and personally deliver it. And other people did that too. And sometimes we delivered them um, all the way in Hamilton and stuff. That led to me um, spending about four years. I used to um, go visit Trinidad, and I'll go to the newspapers and say, how come we can't get the newspapers? You get the Guardian one week and you never see it again. Or you get the Punch, you know, which I used to read the Punch and so on. But, or the Express. So they said, we have nobody up there. And I was an organizing guy. So I said, can I be the guy up there for you? So um, the, the guy, the bum, Chocolongo's son, I think Patrick, not Patrick, his son, Daniel. He would collect from the Guardian all those things, bundle it up, take it to Piaco, ship it up to me, and I'd drive around to the Caribbean places and put my Guardian, my Punch, my Express. I did that for four years, just out of community interest. So that um, um, when we did contrast, there's some people who did sports and would cover, but we, we didn't have a, a, a regular coverage of sports. So sometimes your group, would give us things when you had a special, when it was the final match or the opening match, that type of thing. But it wasn't constantly coming in like you probably do now. And that's when we started forming little associations and groups. And now the soccer became independent until I lost track with them. And I heard from my brother that they were up in a field there okay. and that there'd be a march pass and there'd be like 12 groups in the uniform. Our kids, you know, and stuff, and our friends, and you guys. And there'll be a march pass and stuff. And a couple of times, the, the activities between soccer and music were mostly people who came from Trinidad and other islands. At one point, Flemington was the place to go to connect with the community, you know. Like, I used to go, but not to keep my eye on the ball, but to meet people, you know. Even if we had to play somewhere, we'd come there after type of thing. Just a line, you know, and um, everything happened then, you know, like you mm. meet people. And remember, my brother Lance lived only blocks away. Eh? Lance. So I'd, I'd, I'd see Lance there when I go, you know, and, and get hooked up. <laughs> Lance was the first Caribbean person, the first non-white person to drive one of those trailers along University Avenue, Bay, Bay, Bay Street, in the Caravana Parade. Because you only had white guys driving. They wouldn't give the trucks, you know, to anybody. But Lance broke that barrier, you know, and he used to be dancing, driving that truck down. You remember that? Oh. Came Pan Man Park after the police. Um, since we're talking about history, you know, I referred to my mom, who was the daughter of an Anglican priest in Guyana, and came to Trinidad as a young lady with the old lady. And um, she brought up her, her kids here. We came up. She sent us one at a time. And she came with Junior, 
who was about 10 years old. Oh, not 10. He had to be a little older. Sorry. Chris was about 10. So she... Junior was Jerry. Right? When Jerry came, I, took, I admitted him to high school. You know, I was his guardian. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. I thought that was cute. I was about 20, maybe 22 or 23. You know, I sit up when you're talking to the principal. <laughs> Jerry's a lawyer today. Jerry um, in Ontario is the founder of the Unified Family Court in Ontario where matters, legal matters that has to do with the entire family is in the Unified Family Court. And he started that in Hamilton for the government and he modeled it all over the province. Before that, Jerry, my, this little brother, just before Junior, he was the, um, the, the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. Started, um, he started that one too the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. Now, there was a human rights place that you could go to. I forget what it's called, human rights, whatever. But the tribunal meant if a legal issue came up, the tribunal could deal with it in its entirety. So that's still going on University Avenue. And then they sent him to um, Winnipeg to work on... So, uh, Jerry became the um, first director of the province's Independent Police Review Commission. So... When you have a problem and you complain to the police department in Ontario, whatever department, and you didn't feel you got justice or whatever, you have to go to the Independent Police Review Commission. Jerry started the first one. He just retired. And that started around the G20, just before G20 um, experience we had. And that was his first big report and stuff. So that's Jerry. So he founded the Human Rights um, Tribunal here in Ontario. My elder brother, Russell, who became the dean of UWE in St. Augustine, right in our backyard almost, when he succeeded Sir Frank Warren, who had passed um, during, um, it was during Eric Williams' time, and my Russell became the dean. Um, after that, I think Botiwari, who was a kid who lived close by, and I guess he probably picked up a few things from Russell. Russell died as the um, Dean of Education of the University in Fredericton. Uh -huh. He was the founder of the Maritime Human Rights Commission. So that's for Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland. And she went through that whole experience with Jerry. That's cool. And me and Lance and, and everybody. She was close with all her kids, you know. I tell you. I didn't tell you the steel band, you had asked me about that. So while I was um, in the 80s, I was able to become a teacher here in Ontario. I, got, um, I went to the Faculty of Education in Kingston, Queen's University. And later on, I did courses at York and computer and stuff. So I started and wrote curriculum for steel band as a credit course in our Ontario high schools for grade 9, 10, and 11. You can get three credits. And there are almost 50 schools here in Toronto participating in that program. And there are so many pan teachers that became, pan people who became teachers out of the experience. My greatest success as a teacher, when I teach bands, one year I put together three school bands and we entered the pan alive competition that Muggs used to organize. And then my student, Al Foster, who I've been teaching from grade 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Took him as a student to Trinidad twice for Panorama. Al has won the last eight panel lives here in Toronto in a row. Fantasy. I've been teaching him since he was in grade 7. Pan. I have to push him out my class. Al, you'll be late for the next class. Leave. <laughs> you know? I started doing them um, a few years ago, night school. Something I have. I have a relationship with the Board of Education. So I could use any school that has plans mm -hmm. after school. You know, I just book it and teach. So my first pan school a few years ago in, um, in the West End, front seat, Al Foster. He didn't stay the whole time, but he couldn't resist coming, <laughs> you know. And that's a great student. I'm like, you know, they're like my kids, my musical kids. Earl Lapierre Earl Jr. Afro Pan have a big concert um, near, near the um, museum there in one of those big halls out there. And during the concert, boy, I learned this song and I'm playing this song and there's a baby in the front row 
that decides to scream and bawl throughout the song. I could have played with one stick, you wouldn't know the difference. His name is Earl Appear Jr., ESP. <laughs> I think he was, he was arguing with me from then. <laughs> He's a great, you know, I never forget that. Yeah. I am a member over 20 years of Afropan, you know. Since I moved downtown, I had to belong to the local band, so I joined Afropan. <laughs> Because people ask me sometimes, they've been interviewed, which band you with? I say Afro Pan. Okay, here, you never hear this, eh? but um, I don't know if I could play and sing this one. I never rehearsed it. From the time we packed the pan and we head to the stadium, tonight, tonight, we go cha da da. I forget that part. Anyway, the, the chorus is. We are the people's band, Afro, Afro band. We are the people's band, Afro, Afro band. Oh, yo, la da da de do, la da da de do, something like that. So sure. Before the big block home, mm. one hour before it starts. So if they're going to start five o'clock, I have a Calypso hour for, from four o'clock. Yeah, that would be a big one. I play everything in steel band. I um, write music. I've written two books on steel band. I kept referring to this lady, you know, my mom. So I just saw a picture. You yeah. can see it good? Yeah. Um, yeah. She's been taking me around the music. She always encouraged me. Um, this here is... Um, a copy of my musical journey. It's a book with only pictures, you know, of things okay. that I've done, like the preface and so on. You see, when, we were li when I was leaving Trinidad, the evening news wrote a story. Mm -hmm. Musician of the study. It's stuff like that and different stuff, oh, you know? Musical journey. And it's a, a different booklet I just uh, do. That's now, right. this one, it's a pan book. I've sold hundreds of these. This has everything a person needs to know about pan. After you go through this, you feel like you know about pan, you know, <laughs> even without the personal experience. So it has everything about pan and even music and stuff. And then I wrote another book that has tunes that you could play for pan. I got help from Frankie Francis writing some of the music. Okay. Yeah. 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 See, so that's my stuff here. But you, you know, I can't see without help. Um, but the Lord sort of shine a light when he wants me to see the important things. I'm blessed, you know. I'm, every time I thank the Lord, you know, and I keep getting calls, yeah. Gigging on Thursday, I'm gigging, coming up this week. But yeah, it's um, what I refer to as a plumbing problem. It's um, for us to see aqueous fluid flows like a cascade in front and that's what we see right mm -hmm. in glaucoma patients the aqueous fluid will go in but not come out at the same time so then the lobe begins to get enlarged like a water balloon and in so doing crush the vein the optic nerve um there's no pain no nothing sometimes you're just cleaning your glasses and you get glaucoma and you don't know it's almost hereditary but I think, um, as anything else, stress. And it happened about a year or so after my mom passed. And I was kind of close to her. Okay. So um, maybe that stress that I didn't know about. I was teaching. I had a class. I had five essays to mark. And I kept putting it off. Kept putting it off. And one day I asked a colleague um, if she'd mark it. And right over lunch, you know, boom, 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 she came to grades. And I decided I have to get glasses, new glasses. When I went there and they did the test, since then six surgeries and I'm still laughing. <laughs> so Pat, I want to thank you for giving me the time. Thank you for giving the community, the public at large, all the history. This is a history, not just for the football. This is a history we all need to know that people like you and, and even in your little chunk here, you're doing so well. So I want to thank you again for being there and giving me the time and all the information. I feel it's important. I was glad to participate after over 55 years in this town, you know, and, and 76 years on this planet. I feel so good sharing all that I have. 
and live in stuff. I know I live in Toronto, in Canada. I know that. 